welcome. This is Heritage Words, a podcast about how we engage with our ancestral languages in new and creative ways. Heritage Words is produced by the HUCJIR Jewish Language Project, which raises awareness about Jewish ancestral diversity through the lens of language. I'm your host, Sarah Bunin Benoir. When people hear about the Jewish Language Project, they often ask, oh, you mean you focus on Hebrew and Yiddish? This question is exactly why I founded the Jewish Language Project. Yes, Yiddish is the historical and contemporary language of millions of Ashkenazi Jews, and Hebrew is Lashon HaKodesh, the sacred tongue of Jews in all eras, and the everyday language in ancient and contemporary Israel. But this is only the tip of the Jewish language's iceberg. For many centuries, Jews have lived around the world. When they moved to a new place, they generally picked up the local language and made it distinctively Jewish by adding Hebrew words and creating distinctive pronunciations and grammar. And this leads to languages like Judeo-Greek, Judeo-Arabic, and Judeo-Persian. Yiddish is actually an exception in this history because Jews started speaking it when their neighbors also spoke varieties of German, but then they maintained it for centuries in Hungary, Poland, Lithuania, and elsewhere, where their neighbors spoke completely different languages. Ladino is also an exception. This is another language many Jews have heard of. It, Ladino was initially spoken by Sephardic Jews in Spain, and after the expulsion in 1492, they maintained their Judeo-Spanish language, even when their new neighbors spoke Arabic, Turkish, Greek, Bulgarian, and other languages. So aside from Yiddish and Ladino, most other Jewish languages are somewhat similar to one of the languages spoken by Jews, by non-Jews nearby. I started the Jewish Language Project in 2020 to raise awareness about this rich history. The Jewish Language Project produces educational materials about Jewish languages, including a website, curricula, exhibits, events, and social media posts. We manage crowdsourced dictionaries of several languages, including Jewish Neo-Aramaic and Jewish English. You can see all of these resources at jewishlanguages.org. This podcast is yet another way we're teaching about Jewish linguistic diversity. In each episode, I'll interview someone who has a connection to an ancestral language that they don't fully speak. Why is this so common? Well, there, let me tell you a little bit about the history. From the 18th to the 20th centuries, most Jews around the world migrated. They left Asia, the Middle East, North Africa, and Europe, places where they had lived for centuries, and they moved to Israel, the Americas, and elsewhere. Within a few generations, their families stopped speaking the languages they had spoken for centuries. But the languages have not been completely lost. They survive today in fragmented ways, especially in heritage words. What are heritage words and why did we choose that as the name of this podcast? Our guest today will help us answer those questions. I'm pleased to introduce Dr. Evelyn Dean Olmsted, an anthropologist who coined the term heritage words. She's also the creator of the Jewish Latin American Lexicon and a member of the Jewish Language Project's advisory board. She's taught at the University of Puerto Rico and worked for various research institutions. Today, she conducts program evaluation and other research for Jewish nonprofits at Razov Consulting. Evelyn, welcome to the show. Thank you, Sarah, it's great to be here. So I'm gonna be asking you about your research, but first I wanna start with a quick conversation about your ancestry and heritage and also mine, because we're both scholars who study Jewish language use, but we're also both Jews. So uh, let me just tell you briefly about my own ancestry. Um, I'm Ashkenazi. Most of my ancestors came from Lithuania. My grandfather was born in Cairo, but in an Ashkenazi community. My dad was born in Israel, um, and, and but grew up in America. And so my main heritage language is Yiddish, and Hebrew is also a bit of a her heritage language as well. Uh, some of my own, well, why don't you tell us about your heritage, your ancestry? Okay. Um, yeah, I knew, I know you just got to do some really cool exploration of that heritage recently in Europe. That's so cool. I went to visit my ancestral sites in Lithuania. That's amazing. Um, 
Yeah, so my on my father's side, um, I'm Anglo-German Protestant. And on my mother's side, my mother's mother is um, Baghdadi Jewish via Southeast Asia. She was born in Burma, now Myanmar, and lived in India and immigrated to the U.S. in 1945. And her husband, my grandfather, um, is uh, Hispanic, New Mexican. Their family settled in the region in probably the 15, 1600s. Presence been, has been a long time. And my heritage languages are mostly Spanish. My grandmother, um, her parents spoke Arabic, Judeo-Arabic, but they didn't really pass it on to the children because um, Burma and India were both um, British colonies at the time. And so most of kind of everyday life was in English and they were educated in English as well. Wow. So were there any words from Spanish or Baghdadi Judeo-Arabic that got passed on to you? Really none um, in Baghdadi, Judea, or Arabic. There was a lullaby in, Hin they call it Hindustani. I don't actually know what that is. Um, yeah, so it's I, Hindi, I need to... Hindi and Urdu, you know, because they're very similar. But yeah. Good. And I'm wondering if like maybe a servant sung that to them. And that's how, that's how that, that got into the, yeah, I need to find out more about that. But my main heritage language is Spanish. And that was one that my mother... Um, grew up speaking a little bit but kind of lost it because they moved away from New Mexico when she was young but um for me it's mostly kind of words that have to do with like words terms of endearment and one of my favorites is hito and hita which is like a very New Mexican thing because they call you know my mom calls me hita and hito or and calls little boys hito and when I took Spanish class you know I learned about the word hijo h-i-j-o and I'm like but where's hito so I think kind of my hypothesis about what happened, I'm sure people have studied this, is that, you know, if you say mijito means my little daughter, my little son. And I think the generations that weren't educated to write in Spanish kind of parsed it as me being my and hito to be son or daughter. So then hito and hita remained in our in our English. So that's a very, um, that's a very like New Mexican English um, wow. word. <laughs> yeah. And so did your mom call you that? Or yeah, she still calls me that. Yeah, keep that. <laughs> she writes it in my cards and everything. Yeah. <laughs> oh, that's really cool. Um, well, I, you know, in preparation for this, thought about my own heritage words. And um, they're mostly child-directed speech, including mm -hmm. some terms of endearment, like bunchki, which I think comes from ponchke, which is like a, a roll or a, a, a donut or something like that. Um, <laughs> like a um a pastry and it's like oh you're so cute you're like a little pastry um and also umbashrian which is literally means don't yell and it's sort of i think an apotropaic word or what you refer to as a verbal talisman mm -hmm. like my my parents would my mom especially would say that when uh someone did something cute uh umbashrian like they're so cute, but we don't want the evil eye to get them essentially. And I don't think she was thinking about the evil eye. I think it was just a word that she heard from her parents when she was a kid and doing something cute. Um, also words for body parts like kepi, meaning head and pulkies, meaning uh, like thighs. Um, and notice they're all like E at the end, like kepi and pulkies instead of kop or kepale. And yeah, so, so definitely child directed forms. Also lots of foods like kasha, tsimis, blintzes, matzah brai. Um, and then one other Yiddish word, ungapachke or ungapachkid or ungapachki, uh, which is like, you know, too much, uh, too busy, uh, overwrought. Um, and, and then also some words from Hebrew that were kinship terms um, because my uh, grandparents uh, lived in Israel, and um, my so I referred to my grandfather as Sabi, which is also mm -hmm. a you know child form of Saba, meaning grandfather, and my grandmother uh, I referred to as Imi because my mom called her mother-in-law Ima on on her request, and then I adapted it to Imi, and then of course we had all the religious words like Chala, Kiddush, Menorah, Chumetz which are Hebrew, but Ashkenazi Hebrew uh, influenced. So those are some of the heritage words that, that I grew up with. And I thought it was important to start this podcast with a uh, you know, conversation about my own background as a host and uh, your, your background as, as our scholarly guest. 
Uh, so do you have any thoughts about all that? Um, n no, I just, I love it. And I love like the attention and all the, the variety in um, heritage words, but also the similarities across contexts, which is something we're going to be talking about. Yeah, so that's really something I want to explore on this podcast is how Jews from various places have similarities and differences in the heritage words that get passed down to them and, and how they use them. Awesome. So tell us a little bit about your research in Mexico. So um, when I was doing my PhD in anthropology at Indiana University, I really wanted to, you know, I grew up with my Baghdadi Jewish grandmother, but I really didn't know a lot about um, Middle Eastern Jewish culture outside of my own family. Um, and so I really wanted to, to do research in a uh, contemporary Middle Eastern Jewish community. And I already spoke Spanish and kind of made my way to Mexico City, where it has an incredibly vibrant and incredibly active um, Jewish community, about 40,000 people in Mexico City. Um, and about half of the, the community is um, either uh, Middle Eastern, Syria Lebanese, or Sephardic, uh, Ladino speaking, um, or from Ladino speaking backgrounds. Um, so I ended up, you know, through a, a bit of luck and, and um, circumstance and coincidence, um, ended up uh, doing research in the Shami and Halabi community. Shami means um, Damascene from Damascus, and Halabi means from Halab or Aleppo. Um, and I was interested, you know, at the time, this is in the like late 2000s, early 2010s, like I was kind of a young adult who was like exploring my own Judaism because I had not grown up Jewish and I kind of embraced a Jewish identity as um, as a young adult, like in college. And I was, I spent a lot of time with sort of like more ultra Orthodox outreach kind of efforts like Chabad and Aish and things like that. And so, um, and in Mexico City at the time, actually still today, kind of the Haredi or ultra-Orthodox presence was, was growing and there was a lot of um, kind of Kiruv and outreach efforts, so a lot of classes. And so the young people that I was meeting when I lived in um, in Polanco, which is one of the more now more kind of religious areas of the city, um, the a lot of the young people I, I was meeting and I was meeting them through synagogue. So it was already kind of like um, selecting for people who were more a bit more interested in religion. Um, but they were also kind of in the, on this derech, right? On this path of like exploring and thinking, okay, how how Orthodox are they going to be? Most of them didn't grow up super Orthodox, but they were being exposed to it. Um, so that kind of became the focus. And that's where I spent my time. That's where I met people in classes, classes of Torah, these Torah classes, which were really accessible to me as like a Jewish young person. I was kind of their target audience. Whereas otherwise it might've been a little more difficult to gain access to kind of institutions. Um, so that was one of my focuses. How, how are people navigating this difference? And, and what does it mean to them to be Shami and Halabi in this context? Mostly these are the children and grandchildren of people who arrived to Mexico in like the, the tens and twenties and thirties, a few newer immigrants in the sixties and seventies. So really just what do these ethnic designations mean? And it, it, it was unique to me coming from the United States where it was like, well, you're Sephardi or you're Ashkenazi and that's about it. And in Mexico City, each community institution is really defined by the origins of its members. So there's a, a big institutions for the Shamis, for the Halabis, for the Sephardi and for the Ashkenazi. Um, and so my other interest was linguistically, there, there'd been nothing written about kind of Jewish language practices. And, and for the most part, sociolinguistics in Mexico was very focused on indigenous languages naturally and justifiably, and also kind of language shift and language change among indigenous peoples and the Spanish of, um, of migrants from Latin America, and things like that, a little bit on kind of Spanish immigrants, but there was not a lot of research on the Spanish of, um, transnational migrants and their descendants at all. So, um, yeah, and really, like, there's a lot, there was a lot of, you know, this is sort of the idea, right, Sarah, that you've written about um, and inspired me to look into more is that, you know, once people kind of speak the dominant language, think like, oh, there's nothing really to study, or there's this arbitrary language, like, it has to be different enough for it to be interesting. And I still encounter that time, sometimes, Sarah, in my research, I'm like, well, this isn't interesting. I'm like, but it is. <laughs> so, um, and it turns out that there is quite a lot of distinction um, happening both within these um, Jewish sectors and between Jews and non-Jews. Um, so it's really, it's it, it, my, my work is kind of this dual focus on 
um, the sociolinguistics of being a, a Jewish Mexican, and also these broader kind of sociological processes of people um, making decisions about their lives and their religiosity and who they're going to marry and what kind of job they're going to have and things like that coming of age in, in contemporary Mexico City. Wow. It sounds like such a fascinating research site. And nice. I know from, from your dissertation that it really was, and that you analyzed it in such an interesting way. And part of that analysis was the concept of heritage words. So can you tell us how you came up with that concept? So, you know, that's um, a key part of studying any Jewish language practice is looking at loan words from other la ancestral languages in Hebrew. And so I prepared a, a, the draft of the paper and I showed it to one of my men mentors in Mexico City, Liz Hamwi. She is a sociologist who um, works at UNAM, um, the University of Mexico City. And she's written a lot on, on the Jewish community. She also does medical research. And so she read this article draft of mine and I, and I had a section on loan words in, in the lexicon. And she was like, why? Why? I don't like that word. She's like, they're not we didn't borrow them. Nobody loaned them to us. They're ours. Like, what do you mean loan words? And at the time I was like, oh, but that's just a linguistics term. That's just how we say it. And she's like, well, you should do it differently. <laughs> it's like, you should coin a new word. And I, at the time I was like, I can't do that. You know, that's just the way it is. But I really started to think about it more. And the fact is, is that I was not, I was much less interested in this kind of strict etymology um, of the word. And it was really more interested in like the meaning and function of these words for the people who use them. And they really, you know, the term heritage words kind of came naturally thinking about heritage languages, because it's a relationship you have with a language because of that family connection in history, regardless of how dominant you are in that language. Um, and so heritage words fit really well. And then the more I read about loan words, the more I learned that that's a very tricky, imprecise concept anyways, <laughs> in terms of like, what's borrowing, what's transfer, what's interference, what's code switching, right? Those that's, are sometimes irresolvable date, debates. Yeah, that's true. But even just the, the concept of loan, like people who use a word from another language aren't using it temporarily to give it back. It's kind of an odd term in general, even, even uh, separate from those fuzzy boundaries. It is an odd term. It is an odd term. So the more I, I kind of thought about it, the better I felt about kind of discarding it and using heritage words. And um, I really, I, I drew on notions of heritage, not just heritage language, but heritage theorizing in um, anthropology, especially Barbara Christian Black Gimblet has theorized it a lot in terms of like, you know, it's, it's something in the present. It's something we do and we recreate. We think of it as an old thing that's remained. And sometimes it is an old object that's remained, but kind of what we're doing with it, the meanings we associate with it, that is wholly of the here and now. Um, so, and it's, it's a very ideological thing, kind of what old things count as heritage and what doesn't, you know, what gets kind of elevated and what, and what gets left aside. Um, and then also drew a lot on um, Jeffrey Chandler's work on um, post vernacularity in terms of Yiddish being a language that's not used for day to day communication among a lot of Jews in the US, for example, but still um, has meaning and use. And there's sort of, especially in certain or more kind of artistic and symbolic functions. So like in um, Yiddish magnetic poetry and tchotchkes and t-shirts and, 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 and children's books, but even theater, so that um, all of that kind of contributed to how I, I envision heritage words. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. And when I think of the word, the term heritage words, it reminds me of an heirloom, of something that is passed down in your family. Um, like in my family, I have the candlesticks of my great, great grandmother. And I'm, they're, they're so special to me. Uh, it's, it's an heirloom, you know, and, um, and, um, language is also an heirloom and it's something that gets passed down the generation says and often we don't value it in the same way as we value physical objects um you know some people might have a, a necklace or a ring or a kiddish cup or so many other things that get passed down the generations um words are similar and uh and so i think that's kind of one of the points of this podcast is to highlight how special that is it's also this podcast is part of a broader initiative that the Jewish Language Project is doing called Heirloom, Recovering Our Jewish Family Languages. And one of those tracks is Heritage Words, where we're going to ask 
people to add words to our crowdsourced dictionaries that have been passed down the generations to them. And, um, and then another track is language advocacy, where people will raise awareness about languages and document them and uh, advocate on their behalf. And then the final track is the mentor learner track for people who want to make more of a commitment and actually learn or really engage with their ancestral language. And we will try to match them with a native speaker to, uh, to speak that language to them, to have a little bit of intergenerational transmission. That's really exciting. I'm so excited about that. Um, okay, so heritage words. Um, I, you know, you, you're, when you mentioned Barbara Kirschenblatt Gimblet, I, uh, I just want to read a quote that you quote from her. Um, she's uh, an important scholar who studies uh, heritage and museums, uh, especially Jewish museums. She says, heritage is a new mode of cultural production in the present that has recourse to the past. So I'm wondering, in your research on heritage words, how much were they aware of these words as being connected to the past? Very much so, like very, very much so. So um, I guess I didn't, I don't know if I said this, but the, the main kind of source language of heritage words among Shamin Khalabi Mexicans is Arabic um, and, or words that are conceived of as Arabic, even if they're not. But um, there was a lot of awareness that these were sort of, um, that they were kind of in-group words. There was some, a little bit of sort of like there was some negative ideology surrounding them, but stigma, basically. Um, and I can talk about that a bit more in in um, a, in a bit. But um, yes, there is absolutely awareness that these are kind of these are are from past generations still around. Even sometimes when I ask the younger people, like, do you use these words? Like, no, it's más de las abuelitas. Like, that's like kind of the grandmother words, or de las señoras grandes. Yo no. So there was there was some sort of like, no, that's kind of the more the old ladies do that more and me not so much. So, yeah, for sure. Well, that's something I want to explore in this series is is to what extent people just know these words from hearing them from their grandparents or are using them themselves. And how important is it to the interviewees to pass these words down to their children? To what extent are they in use in communities today? Uh, so that's those are some things we're going to explore. Um, so you mentioned that in, in the word you mentioned from Spanish that is part of your family, mm -hmm. and some of the words I mentioned are terms of endearment. They're, they're terms that a parent or grandparent would say to a child, and or, or maybe also to um, other people in the family or just other young people. Um, and so was that a big part of the collection of heritage words that you found in Mexico? Absolutely. Um, ethno, um, words of terms of endearment and words for words for people in general, kinds of both positive and negative, but certainly terms of endearment are are a big one. Absolutely. Um, in um, in Mexico, words like roji, which means like my my oh, my heart, I think. I'm sorry. Um, there's yeah, but that that that's a big and that does seem to be something that resonates across the board. The terms of endearment are really really prominent. Okay, and what are some other categories of heritage okay. words? Um, so absolutely, uh, food, right? Food is a big one. That's as you mentioned in your family. So uh, foods in Mexico City are like quipes and um, mahasha and other other Arabic Arab foods, um, and also just not even saying them, but kind of talking about them, right? It becomes a really fun way of kind of engaging in your shared identity with somebody. Um, <laughs> words that have to do with religion in, in Mexico city, it's, if you say, um, I'm going to the Kines, the Kines means, um, congregation or, or meeting place or synagogue in Arabic. If you say, I'm going to the Kines, you know, that you're Shamir Khalabi. If you say, I'm going to Shul, you know, you're Ashkenazi. Um, and also, you know, different, different Hebrew pronunciations becomes an important signifier as well, right? If you say Arbi versus Mariv. Um, for the afternoon prayer, um, if you say uh, chacham versus rab, so chacham is means sort of sage in Hebrew, but it's used as a term of address for rabbis in Syrian communities. So that becomes an important domain for distinction. Um, other kind of like emotional words, right? Insults, uh, um, curses. Yiddish is the best for curses. Arabic has some really great curses too. Um, 
but that um a lot of taboo words body body parts body language uh words for for body parts um and a lot of uh kinship terms words for your your grandmother your grandfather or um your mother-in-law um so yeah that's um that is most of them I have a more kind of extensive list but we, we there is kind of a, a a recurring thread that it's words for the people close to you um it's words with a lot of emotion a lot of in, often kind of intense emotion both positive and negative a lot of child directed language as you mentioned um and then words having to do with kind of community shared community life like religion um, mm -hmm. and other kind of cultural traditions and festivals and things like that. Yeah. And also, also insults and bad words, like using it as, a, as taboo language, which is really, you know, widely documented for, you know, sort of talking about things we shouldn't be talking about, then that a lot of times you'll use terms from, from your heritage language. Yeah. Yeah. Well, so about the foods, that's an interesting one because that's something that people from any background use when they're talking about the foods from a particular culture, right? Like if you yeah. go to a Greek restaurant, you order spanakopita and you order pita at a Middle Eastern restaurant, right? Um, you could just say, I want flat bread or I want spinach and cheese pastry. Mm -hmm. But, you know, we, it's pretty common to just use the word from that culture. And mm -hmm. so some people would say, well, that's not really a heritage word. That's just a food word. What do you think about that? Oh, um, sure. But again, I think it sort of like it's it's not about what I call a heritage word. It's kind of what people, you know, when I ask people, like, what are the palabras that you know? What are the Arabic words, you know? Like, people, have, you know, inevitably give these <laughs> give these words, you know? So I think it's more that they they see them, and definitely their reference is an important piece of it, right? So maybe it's not a heritage word when I go for, you know, Hispanic but it is a heritage word for Greek people ah. who eat it with their family. <laughs> okay, well, that's a really important distinction that it's it's individuals who are part of a culture. Uh, when they use a word, it's a heritage word. When people outside the community use it, maybe it's no longer a heritage word. So maybe um, then it just becomes a loan word or a word that has transferred beyond the community of its origin. Yeah, absolutely. Okay. Well, so that's something we'll explore in this series. You know, I'll be asking people about words and we'll see if any of those words have made their way beyond the community at hand. Um, can you think of any examples in Mexico of words that originated in the Syrian community but have become part of the broader Mexican lexicon? Broader Mexican or broader Jewish Mexican? Oh, okay. Well, let's start with broader Jewish Mexican. Um, okay. Broader Jewish Mexican. I'm going to have to give that one some thought. Um, I will say definitely, and this is an area for further research, um, the ultra Orthodox sectors have continued to grow to the, um, extent that the, the, the yeshiva is called the yeshiva Keter Torah. So the, the, the Haredi, um, religious day school is now the largest of Mexico City's many Jewish day schools. And that school, this, I didn't do firsthand research on this, but I did speak to, I did interview a teacher. And that school has the, the observant students from all the different communities. And like the dominant kind of lingo is all these Arabic words. And actually I did speak to the, um, the Ashkenazi, some of the Ashkenazi uh, parents who had their kids in that school, and they would complain to me, like they come home saying all these Arabic words, like they didn't like it. So that definitely in those sectors, it has certainly, um, it has certainly spread to other usage to the, to, in, in other sectors, it would, um, I think we would have to, I would need to give that one a little more thought and a little more research. Wow. Well, that's, that's a really interesting example of that. And that's what you see in many American communities in the opposite way that the dominant stream is Ashkenazi. And when Jews from Middle Eastern backgrounds, North African backgrounds come into those schools, they have to learn Ashkenazi Jewish English, which has a lot of Yiddish words. So they end up saying, I'm going, I daven in a Sephardi shul. I've heard that sentence many times from Sephardi Jews in America, mm -hmm. uh, and which is, it has two words from Yiddish, Daven and Shul, but those are words that have been, become part of American 
Jewish English. Mm -hmm. um, however, I'm wondering if in this series we'll find um, the opposite trend also in America, like for example, in Seattle, where there's a large um, Ottoman Sephardic community, um, to what extent are the Ashkenazi Jews that live in that community using words from Ladino? And similarly in, um, in Brooklyn, to what extent in a Syrian dominant community there are any Jews of other backgrounds um, acquiring their Judeo-Arabic words as well? Yeah. Well, you, you told me that your daughter's Persian friends, I remember in, in LA, that they would affix the, the suffix June, right, which is a, a suffix of endearment, <laughs> that, you're, that some of your daughters like adopted that speech. <laughs> so that's oh my gosh. Yeah, my, my, my daughter, who has several Persian Jewish friends, still uses, she's 21, and she still uses several Persian words. And sometimes she'll say a word, and I'll say, what is that? She's like, oh, it's Persian. <laughs> it means whatever. <laughs> um, so right, I mean, th when we think about influence, it's not just the dominant stream that influences the minority stream, the, the influence goes in all directions. Yeah, I, I know of more examples of Syrian Jews in Mexico who use Ashkenazi influence. For example, I think kosher is becoming more common than kasher. Like there's still some, you know, some people who say kasher, which is, they're both Hebrew, but they're just different traditional pronunciations. And I think saying kosher as an adjective um, is becoming more common among younger people. And wow. I've also heard some, well, this was, I'm going to leave that aside, but yeah. So I think if anything, it might go in the other direction. Yeah. Yeah. What about the word pishar? Is that a word? Oh yeah. Pishar is the best. Um, pishar means to pee. And like everybody, everybody spoke to them in Mexico city, whatever their ancestral language was, they claimed to be shard. <laughs> so like, what, what Yiddish words do you use? And they'd say be shard. And they'd say, what Ladino words do you use? They'd say be shard. What Arabic words do you use? They'd say be shard. And they are, we're all convinced it was theirs. I'm, I'm, it's, it's pretty clearly from um, Ladino, which actually a colleague of ours, Ana Jelly Hernandez Cruz helped me to see, although my other Ladino colleagues said that as well. That's but so um, oh, it's made that's... it into, yeah, the marriage lexicons, yeah. <laughs> well, because that's another one that I for, I thought didn't think to mention in my own heritage words. We said pish as, you know, do you have to go pish? Um, and that for us, it was definitely from Yiddish, um, uh, pishin. Um, but, you know, maybe maybe this word uh, has been become part of multiple languages. And that that's definitely an article that someone needs to write. <laughs> Not really. Let's that'll be our future article, Sarah. <laughs> I mean, it's part of euphem. It's a, it's part of the euphemism domain of heritage words, right? Where it's yeah, yeah, yeah. A little uncomfortable to say a word that's taboo or that's about a bodily function or mm -hmm. sex or death or things that make people afraid. They're often used in other languages, and um, that's especially common in Jewish languages. You have a lot of Hebrew words. Uh, for example, the word hamakom or makom, um, meaning toilet, uh, that is a, a term that's used in, in several Jewish languages. I didn't know that. Place. <laughs> um, okay, so we, we talked a little bit about um, transfer of words out of a community, but I want to ask about the opposite trend, which is words that are used just in a family, but not in the broader community. Do you consider those also to be heritage words? Yeah, absolutely. I would. Yeah, for sure. I would just, um, the scale is different, but um, yeah, I'd say that honestly, they're like heritage words par excellence. <laughs> like they're really with associated with one's a very literal, you know, heritage and descendants. So for sure. Yeah. Well, so do you have a sense of the roles of family and community in perpetuating heritage words? Like, do you think that some words are, um, um, really more transmitted through the family while others are more transmitted through the community? Mm, that's a good question. And, you know, by the community, I guess maybe we're thinking like in synagogue and school context and kind of institutional yeah. context. Yes. Like, yes, yes. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Especially, of course, the terms of endearment. Although, you know, I would say like probably teachers in, in, in Jewish educational context are probably using those same terms of endearment. It might be hard to draw a, a, a that's probably just gonna vary by context in terms of like how much of a distinction there is between 
between the family and the broader Jewish community, honestly. Mm, yeah, that's true. And it probably also depends how concentrated a particular group is. So if if the institutions are all from um, a community of a particular ancestry, right. then they'll be more likely to um, transmit uh, certain words in the- Yeah, in the right. In the case of Mexico City, it's hard. I think it's hard to make that distinction. In the case of most communities in the US, for sure, for sure, when, you know, when, when a lot of times the synagogue is, has people from a lot of different backgrounds, and, and so you might just be all sort of using, I don't know what the rabbi uses or something, and it, it's not going to be the same, yeah. Right, well, yeah, so the, in Mexico is unique in that way, in that it still maintains these uh, ancestral distinctions in a way that some communities in America do a little bit, like you'll have the Yemenite synagogue and the Persian synagogue in L.A., but you know, a lot of them are mixed. Even those synagogues will draw people from different backgrounds. And then the communities, the synagogues that and schools that are predominantly Ashkenazi are increasingly mixed. And there are more and more Mizrahi Jews coming into those communities. And so I really think we're at this historical moment uh, in American Jewish history where you have um, a mixing going on and and communities that were historically one um, branch of the Jewish world are now becoming more and more mixed and we'll we'll have to see how that develops. I think we're really developing um, what we might call Minhag America, which is a term that's been used in several contexts um, and meaning like a, an American tradition. you know, you have the Ashkenazi tradition and the Sephardi tradition. Maybe we have an American tradition that's developing that involves a lot of um, is Ashkenazi influence and a lot of modern Hebrew influence and also increasing influences from, you know, Jewish communities around the world. Yeah, I bet that's right. Yeah, that's very interesting. I, in Mexico City, it's there are still these big communities that are kind of organized along ethnic lines and um, marriage between different sectors only continues to increase. And um, again, I just want to mention our, our colleague, Ana Gelli Hernandez Cruz, who's a Mexican sociolinguist who trained at the Colegio de Mexico, um, which is a very prestigious university in Mexico City. Um, and she, her research is on language shift among the Ashkenazi Jewish community. And she did, um, she first analyzed interviews that were conducted in the 1980s. Um, with um, Ashkenazi migrants to Mexico City, looking at Yiddish Spanish influence, like when code switching, but also Yiddish influences in the Spanish and vice versa. Um, and then she's done heritage word research among future generations and um, second generation and third generation. And she has really um, laid out that really next steps needs to be looking at people um, who are the children of quote unquote mixed marriages of. Um, you know, mm -hmm. marriage between people from different um, Jewish sectors in Mexico City and kind of see like, okay, what's going on with with heritage words there? There is, yeah, that that'll be, that is something really to be, to look at. And there were some, some of those in my, in my community, in my, um, the people that I worked with in my research. Yeah. yeah. And I think we'll have several of those interviewed on this uh, podcast. In fact, a lot of the people we have lined up for interviews are children of mixed marriages. So we'll see mm -hmm. how that's going. Nice. Um, so one more question. You mm, talk about Hebrew as uh, um, Hebrew words as heritage words. Can you tell us about that decision? Like not just including Arabic words as heritage words. Yeah, well, number one, it is often impossible to clearly, you know, delineate the, the um, the etymology of any given word. And so like we talked about, um, you know, the word Arbit or Mariv, like, oh, is that Arabic or is that um, is that Hebrew? I mean, it originally came from Hebrew, but it was incorporated into the people, the way that into people's Arabic speech as sort of a, a heritage word. So, right, it's kind of, you, you can never go all, all the way back. Yeah. So that's one reason where I don't think you should ever apply kind of strict etymological definitions to what is a heritage word. But the other word is that, and the other reason is that, um, that, you know, on a different level, of course, you know, Jewish identification and Hebrew is like, is the heritage language for all Jews. And so, and it's always played that role in every Jewish language practice, you know, throughout history and time and space. And it isn't, you know, it is 
100% associated with heritage. Sometimes it's a more abstract, right? sense of heritage. Now it is associated with the state of Israel, right? So there's a whole kind of different level to it, um, as opposed to kind of like religious liturgical Hebrew terms or whatever that are, are words for holidays. So I just don't think you can really kind of have a complete picture. And again, it it's really about understanding the perspective and the ideology of the people who are using them. Like, oh, I'm using this and this feels like an Arabic word to me, even though technically it's Hebrew or Ladino or Yiddish or whatever. And this, like when I say, for example, nua, right? That's a word that's really common um, in Latin America for youth group. It comes from Hebrew. Like in Spanish, it's spelled T-N-U-A. Um, and there's a lot of these kind of more modern Zionist words or 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 este, madrig or madrija or things like that. There's things that you really might be kind of feeling and thinking of as more as like a modern Israeli Hebrew showing that. So I, I just think you can't really discount anything and you just have to, you got to do the ethnography and kind of see what is relevant and salient to people. I love that. So we'll keep that in mind as we do our interviews that we need to have an insider community perspective rather than an outsider researcher perspective. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Yeah. So what else do you want to know about heritage words among among contemporary Jews? Because maybe we'll be able to help answer that through our interviews. What a great question. Yeah, I really think, you know, I I kind of meant, you know, I kind of lay out um, in, in the dissertation and in the book, these kind of qualities of heritage words that I think are sort of shared, right? And what is this high emotion? A lot of them are associated with high emotion. And I recently uncovered some research in like in kind of neurolinguistics that talks about how the way we process some of these high emotion words, like that you're saying to your baby or your dog when you feel really strong love or when you're shouting in anger, that they're really, there's like a different kind of cognitive and neurological processes kind of going on with those words. And so it, it kind of makes sense that those are gonna stick around more and be transmitted. Mm -hmm. Um, and the other, you know, in terms of the salience, that's something that can kind of come and go. And, and, and it's interesting to see when things are really on people's radar and when they're not, you know, um, you know, talking to my, I talked to my kids confirmation class and they were really not so aware. I was like, what are the Yiddish words in your family? So like, I don't know. And then I started giving them examples. They're like, oh yeah. Oh yeah. That's Yiddish. What, when, mm -hmm. at what point does it kind of come to their awareness that that is Arabic or that is Yiddish? Um, and, and when does that become a very salient marker of identity? Also, their association with strong language ideologies. I'd like to see very how that might vary across context. In Mexico City, it's very much that um, there is, as I said, there's stigma kind of related to broader sort of Orientalist kind of anti-Arab stigma that's present in the Jewish world, but also in the non-Jewish wor world. Um, and that influences a lot in how people use these words. Some people don't use them for that reason. And other people really, really enjoy using them for that reason. It's having a kind of a covert prestige, as, as Bill above said, like kind of enjoying it and celebrating it, even though you know it's stigmatized by the wider community. And then just like the way these words are used really to like construct a stance of like what kind of Jew you are. So th that's what I'm interested in, is in to see to what extent these, these qualities are present or not and variation in it in, in different contexts of heritage words. Amazing. Okay, so we will look for all of those issues in this series, and we might come back to you again uh, once we've done some interviews to help us uh, analyze what we found. Ooh, I hope so. Okay, well, thank you so much, Dr. Evelyn Dean Olmsted, and we'll be in touch. And thank you, Sarah, for all the amazing work you're doing with Jewish languages. You have like inspired and supported so many of us, and this work is just so great for bringing it to a wider public. Okay. Take care, everyone.